Main audio test. Main audio. Switch to Yeti. Test, test. Ooh. Mm. Is that better? We'll find out. So about a year ago, I did a video on five things I wish I knew before keeping reptiles. I thought I would kind of do a part two to that. Not necessarily as important things or things that I needed to know. It's just more like, oh, well, I'd, I know that now. <laughs> So some of these are, I would say, a bit important, but most of them are just kind of random things that I didn't expect. So here are some of those things. Starting off with the smells in the room. Not just the smells, but the smell of the poop in the room. Now, it's often a concern that your animals or reptiles specifically are going to smell when they're in your room. And that's only going to happen if you don't clean up after them, just like any other animal on Earth. <laughs> but it's not so much the actual smell you... I can't breathe. But it's not so much the actual smell. I mean, you, you don't expect it to smell good. This is coming out of an animal that like ate a rat a few weeks ago. Uh, but I learned that you can differentiate the smells of different species and even different individuals. Like I can just wander into the room some random day and I'm like, that's the Savannah monitor, gotta go clean up after her. Or like the next day, just wandering and immediately hits you. That's Gobi, the corn snake, time to get cleaning. So is this valuable information? Not really, but I think it's interesting. I also think it's interesting how even individual animals can smell differently. Now, the biggest differences are probably between like herbivores and carnivores because it's gonna be gross, but herbivores, they're a little more like sweet smelling. It's not necessarily an immediate bad smell while the carnivores are just like musty and strong, like right off the bat. But even individual species, like I don't know what it is about corn snakes. They are always the worst snake. Even rat snakes aren't as bad, but they're basically the same. They're like as close to species as you can get just about. What is the science behind that? I don't know. Somebody let me know. I'm curious. But uh, if you ever wondered if, if you can differentiate smells, I can, and you probably will too over time. The second one ties into where the poop comes from. Uh, specifically the food, and that is that different animals will have different taste preferences. So when reading care guides for, say, a leopard gecko or a blue tongue skink or something, you're gonna have this chart of like different things it can eat. Leopard geckos are insectivores and can only eat different types of bugs, but even then they are often a picky species that'll only want a certain insect and they even change their preferences. I'll get back to leopard geckos in a minute, but especially with any animal that eats plants, even though there will be certain plants that are the healthiest for them, it doesn't mean they're gonna like them. I just assume that their minds are simple enough to just eat whatever they're supposed to eat, but that's not the case. For example, my blue tongue skink, Olive, uh, she loves certain plants, especially sweet ones like fruits and certain vegetables, but just like people, uh, you shouldn't consume too much sugar and there isn't necessarily as much nutrition there. So there are things like one of the most uh, healthy is collard greens. But of course, Olive just hates collard greens. I have to kind of trick her into eating them. Uh, I'll do things like rub fruit on them so they smell like or, and taste like fruit. But even then, uh, things like dandelion greens are another super healthy option for blue tongues. So I tried those and she likes them. So there's a lot of playing around with different preferences of what your animal's actually gonna want. In a way, it's fun. You're gonna have to become a personal chef to your animal to figure out exactly what they want while at the same time making sure it's a healthy diet. You don't wanna be like one of those parents that just feeds their kids McDonald's every day because it's the only thing they eat and then they get obese and like die at age of... <laughs> this is morbid, I'll just move on. But even with certain insect preferences, like my leopard gecko Goldie, he started on superworms when I got him. He wouldn't eat the superworms, so I tried different things. He ended up eating mealworms. Uh, and then I wanted to switch him to dubias. Luckily he switched to dubias and then he stopped eating dubias. So we went back to superworms. <laughs> at some point I think I did crickets, but I hate crickets and I haven't fed them in like three years because they're just the worst. Luckily, now he eats kind of everything, so they can really switch around, not only between animals with preferences, but their own preference might be different each week or each month or each year. Usually it's pretty consistent, but it's something else I noticed. Speaking of even more preferences is even though care guides will say that a certain animal needs a certain temperature or a certain whatever, the individual animal sometimes differs from that just a little bit. Now, I always shoot for the correct, correct temperature. Like what even is correct? Who makes these standards? Usually it's breeders and keepers that have seen how animals do the best and how they are the healthiest, but overall it's still a bit of an average. So I have noticed that, back to leopard geckos, I can use the same thermostat brand and the same heat gun brand 
so that I know all the temperatures are the same, and yet some still just prefer certain areas. Some might want to be directly on that heat mat right at like 94 degrees, others might want to be in the cooler end. So you could argue that there might be something wrong in the enclosure that's keeping them from that area, or some other variable. But I feel like I've had a pretty good test at this point where everything will be the same, exact same setups, whatever, and they still just have very slightly different preferences. Uh, ball pythons. This is Smokey, my smallest ball, or I guess second smallest ball python. Uh, he, I decided to grab him for the video because he tends to be out a lot of the day. I actually have UVB on him, which I generally don't keep on ball pythons, but he seems to actually enjoy it. He does end up sitting on top of his hide and absorbing that UVB, which like cool, even though they're a nocturnal species, it looks like he can still benefit from it. Meanwhile, Sunny, my other, uh, one of my other ball pythons, he also has UVB, but he doesn't use it. He just hides all day, so it's kind of a waste and I don't really need it there. <laughs> this could also tie into just how comfortable or nervous they are around the environment or the people. For example, Smokey is not very head shy. If I can, yep, there's his head. He really doesn't mind. Meanwhile, Sunny will just immediately back away. He never strikes or anything. Uh, but he does get nervous when you touch his like special places like his head that he wants to protect. But even then, it's not even necessarily just temperature, because Smokey will keep like his body on the heat mat and then will kind of coil around on top, so his head's sticking out seeing what's going on, while others will just completely hide. So they have preferences of how exposed they want to be, this, their favorite spots in the enclosure, and everything do not necessarily always correlate across every single individual. So I don't know, I thought their minds were more simple than that, like how I said with the food, but they proved me wrong again. And then one that is completely not really related to the animals, but the things that you buy for the animals. This is kind of a big one, and that is that just because a product says reptile on it, doesn't mean it's A, the best product for a reptile, or B, even necessary. In some cases it's even bad for them. Like, let's look at thermostats for example. I've been learning about drop shipping and different things where you like buy stuff in bulk from China and then you put your own branding on it and resell it. Uh, this is a very common practice. Almost everything on Amazon is drop shipped. Like not everything, but most of it. A lot of it, okay? Like I found some dog beds on Amazon that were $99. You can get them for 99 cents in China. And this is commonly what is done with reptile thermostats. I was casually browsing some Chinese sites and I happen to see a thermostat I recognized. Zilla just buys them in bulk, prints their logo on it, and marks it as a reptile product. That's perfectly fine. Personally, I don't like that thermostat, but an example of a thermostat I do like is like the iPower one. These are like 15 bucks and they've been working great for me. iPower does the same thing. They buy them in bulk, print their logo on it, and sell them. But different companies sell them for different things. The Zilla one says reptile, iPower says like plant and reptile, and you can probably get some that says nothing or says it's just for plants or whatever. Basically, people try and advertise different products to a niche just to try and get them to buy them because it says the thing on it. Like look at gaming stuff, like a gaming mouse. It might have some RGB on it or a gaming chair. It might have like fancy colors and be like really tall, but in the end you can use any chair. Yes, I do buy all the gaming branded stuff because I like it, but it you are paying a premium for that. You can find a lot of reptile products that are unbranded, that aren't even for reptiles necessarily, but they do the same job just because they're not advertised for it. And then on the flip side, sometimes they're bad. Cough, cough, calci sand, <laughs> or like certain cheap foods or whatever. I don't, I'm getting like really off topic, but even look at like cat foods. Like they'll say cat food, but it's like, don't feed that to your cat. It's not good. So I didn't, exp I just, I assume that you could have 100% trust in certain brands. And I think it's important to just stay skeptical skeptical, skeptical of all of them. Uh, and most of the time they are fine. I have tons of Zoomed products I love, tons of Exoterra products I love, a couple Zilla products. I don't really like Zilla. There goes that sponsorship. Uh, or whatever. There's, there's a lot of variation. So just double check it and make sure it's safe. And that is the final thing that I didn't expect while keeping reptiles. So yeah, I hadn't done like a list video in a while. I used to do these more often like five things to look out for at an expo or whatever else. So I wanna keep doing these. I don't know if I'll call them a series or not, but they're kind of a series. Also, I'm verified now on YouTube, a verified creator. Woo. And 100,000, of course. I posted about that on Instagram, but thanks for supporting me, whether you gave the video just a view or commented on it or bought a, some merchandise. There's none available as of recording this, but you can still go to goherpingshop.com or goherping.com to see what's, what's happening there. 
If you're interested in purchasing a reptile, check out emeraldscales.com. That's our site where we sell animals. It's, it's pretty cool. Some of the animals in here are for sale right now, so you can see that. But uh, let me know what you did not expect while getting into the reptile trade. And that's it. But there we go. That's it. So I'm Alex, and thanks for watching. <laughs>